What is operations management? Operations management is a large term for several smaller subjects. When a company wants to operate smoothly, grow their business, satisfy customers, and make money, operations management is at work. E-commerce, global competition, customer service, productivity, and quality are all parts of operations management. Without globalization, it is impossible for a company to expand to a larger, more beneficial market. If a company does not have good customer service, then it will not have satisfied customers, and therefore no business and no profits. Productivity and quality must be at a maximum in order for them to make the most money for a business. All of these elements need to work together to create a successful business. So, what exactly is operations management? Operations management is the management of systems or processes that create goods or provide services. Let's start with goods. Goods are defined as physical items that include raw materials, parts, and subassemblies as well as final products such as cell phones and automobiles. These goods cost the consumer money and are sold by a business. Services, on the other hand, are activities that provide some combination of time, location, form, or psychological value. These are also provided by a business. Examples of goods and services can be found all around us. All businesses have a supply chain. A supply chain is a process that is put in place by a company in order to gather materials, produce, and distribute their product. These supply chains can include a business's facilities, functions, and activities that are involved in producing and delivering a product or service. A supply chain sequence begins with raw materials and concludes at the final product which the customer purchases. There are three types of interrelated processes that businesses are composed of. These processes include upper management processes, operational processes, and supporting processes. Each of these is different and corresponds to different levels of a company similar to their titles. All businesses, no matter what size, use these basic processes to produce and provide the products and services that we, as consumers, desire. Operations management includes many activities that a company uses to allow it to run more smoothly. These include forecasting, capacity planning, facilities and layout, scheduling, managing inventories, assuring quality, motivating and trading employees, locating facilities, purchasing, distribution, and maintenance. Forecasting involves identifying trends in a company's past data in order to plan for the future. This allows for a company to be able to order raw materials, hire and fire employees, and identify the products that will be the most profitable in the near future. Forecasting goes hand in hand with capacity planning as well as purchasing. These activities would not be completed, completed accurately without forecasting. Managing inventories also is closely related to capacity planning, purchasing, and forecasting. However, inventories are managed more often and with less lead time than the previously mentioned activities. Distribution is similar to managing inventories because of the lack of lead time given before a product needs to arrive to a customer. Motivating and training employees is an activity connected to assuring quality for the company. If a company's employees are motivated and excited to work, then the quality of a product is going to be better than if an employee didn't have that motivation. Placement of facilities is essential in the distribution of products to the customer and even the transportation of raw materials to a company. Locating the placement of a facility is based on the closeness of a supplier as well as the cost of distribution and the distance to customers. So why learn about operations management? 
Businesses are created to be profitable and successful. Things like forecasting, location planning, and quality assurance are essential in creating a profitable business. Without these tools, that wouldn't be possible. What is hospitality? Hospitality can be the friendly and generous reception and entertainment of guests, visitors, or strangers. Operations management is the management of the processes that produce or deliver goods and services. Operations management decisions directly affect the size, shape, quantity, quality, price, profitability, and speed of delivery of the output of hospitality organisations, whether at the luxury end of the market or a budget product or service. The hotel product is made up of five characteristics. Location, mix of facilities, which include bedrooms, restaurants, other public rooms, function rooms and leisure facilities. Image, public perception and relations. Services it provides, including the level of formality, personal attention, speed and efficiency of its staff. And prices charged. Food operations. Restaurant managers are generally responsible for the following. Exceeding guest service expectations, hiring, training, developing employees, setting and maintaining quality standards, marketing, banquets, coffee service, in-room dining, mini bars or the cocktail lounge, and presenting annual, monthly and weekly forecasts and budgets to the food and beverage director. Bars. In a large hotel, there are several kinds of bars. Lobby bars, restaurant bars, service bars, pool bars, nightclubs, mini bars, sports bars, and casino, banqueting, and catering bars. Stewarding. The responsibilities of a chief steward are cleanliness of the back of house, cleanliness of glassware, china, and cutlery, Maintaining strict inventory, control and monthly stock check. Maintenance of dishwashing machines. Inventory of chemical stock. Sanitation. Pest control. And forecasting labour and cleaning supply needs. Meetings. For meetings, a variety of room setups are available depending on a client's needs. The most frequently selected meeting room setups are theatre style, classroom style and horseshoe style. Rooms division. The rooms division is comprised of the front office, reservations, housekeeping, concierge, guest services including room service, bellboy or porter, laundry, security and communications. The main concerns of the department are financial performance, employee satisfaction, guest satisfaction, guest services, guest relations and security. Front office. The front office is the heart of a hotel. Associates of this department are responsible for the guest's first and last impression of the hotel. According to studies, the last impression is a lasting impression, which will be instrumental for the guest's decision to return to the hotel for his next visit. The main functions of the front office are to sell rooms, to maintain balanced accounts, and to offer services such as handling mail, faxes, messages, and local and hotel information. Reservations. The reservations manager is the head of the reservations department. He or she reports directly to the rooms division manager. This department is often the first one that a prospective guest has contact with and therefore impressions made are lasting. Quality service and attention to detail are critical. Housekeeping. The housekeeping department employs the largest number of employees in the hotel. The executive housekeeper is the head of the department. The executive housekeeper is responsible for a substantial amount of record keeping. In addition to the scheduling and evaluation of employees, he or she also maintains an inventory of all guest rooms and public area furnishings. Let's move on to part two. 
different influences affecting patterns of demand within hospitality operations. Let's remind ourselves of the types of hospitality outlets. Influences that could affect patterns of demand could be opening hours, the time of day or week, seasonality, sociological influences, healthy eating and drinking patterns, food and fashion trends, accommodation trends, cultural, regional and ethnic influences, pricing and economic factors, and elasticity of demand. Opening hours. The hospitality industry is a 24-7, 365 out of 366 days industry. The pattern of demand is therefore influenced by this. Seasonality. Seasonality is a characteristic of a time series in which the data experiences regular and predictable changes which reoccur every calendar year. Hospitality product services are seasonal, which means they do not have a common nature throughout. Hence, they change from season to season to provide required services as demanded by customer. Sociological influences. There have been a lot of changes in the family unit, influencing people's spending. Many families will have two incomes, increasing disposable income, but reducing time available to cook. This therefore increases the demand for fast food and eating out. A grab and go culture of food on the run, Coffee bars, sandwich shops or takeaways contribute to the lack of cooking skills. Healthy eating and drinking. The lifestyle of people are changing and this is evident in the choices displayed by hospitality customers. For example, the increase in demand for healthy food and the increase in demand for organic food. The life expectancy is expected to increase due to healthy options in diet and the way of life. This will affect the demand of product and services offered in the hospitality sector. Visitors to Beijing will be able to stay in the latest of the country's spectacular hotels. It's the Kempinski Sunrise. It opens its doors this week. It's encased within 10,000 glass panels. It's lit up at night by LEDs and it has the appearance, as you might guess, of a rising sun. Two distinguished hotels on opposite sides of the tunnel will be reopening after a long refurbishment. The Lanesborough is due to welcome back guests in London from spring next year after renovation work lasting 18 months. And the long-awaited return of an old friend, the Ritz in Paris, should finally reopen in 2015. Technology will continue to revolutionise the way we book and stay in hotels. Accommodation choices are increasingly being made online and social network sites like TripAdvisor. Instant messaging apps such as WeChat in China and Line in Japan are used to book rooms. And a lack of free Wi-Fi will become the biggest reason not to book a hotel. As for those room keys, they will start to appear as phone apps. Those in search of Jeeves, the butler, not the search engine, while Starwood has the robotic butler, known as the bottler. Being served breakfast by a bottler on your hotel balcony, overlooking one of the wonders of the world. Now that's perfect fodder for a bragging, a particularly boastful kind of selfie. Of all the trends, this will be the hottest in 2015. And some hotels will even reward guests who post braggies on their room. Braggy up in 2015. Elasticity of demand. How many times a day or a week do you make a decision to buy something based on price? Would your buying habits change if a new dress shirt cost $70 instead of $15? How about if a gallon of milk cost $7 instead of 4 Whether you make 5 decisions a day or 50, 
There's no doubt that price elasticity of demand is playing a major role in your purchases. Let's discuss price elasticity of demand and how it plays a role in the everyday life of consumers or business owners like you and I. In talking about the price elasticity of demand, it's worth reviewing the law of demand, which states that more of a good will be demanded the lower its price, all else constant. Less of a good will be demanded the higher its price, all else constant. How much more or less is demanded? That is where elasticity comes in. Price elasticity of demand is the measure of the percent change in the quantity of a good demanded divided by the percent change in the price of that good. It is the term economists use to describe how responsive consumers are to a change in price. I bet you can think of an item you wouldn't hesitate to pay more for if the price rose. How about an item you might not buy any longer if the price increased? That logic and reasoning is exactly what makes up and determines the price elasticity of demand. It is a very important concept in economics and a foundation for many advanced lessons on how individuals and business owners make purchasing decisions. For example, if a Major League Baseball ticket increased in price, many people would likely cut back on going to the game, all else constant. If it goes down, people will go more often and actually increase revenue for the baseball club. Let's summarize. Food outlets are divided into restaurants, lounges, bars, room service, meeting and conference rooms, ballrooms and others. The rooms division department contains front office, reservations, housekeeping, concierge, guest services such as room service, bellboy, porters, laundry, security and communications. There are many influences that affect patterns of demand like opening hours, seasonality, sociological influences, healthy eating, food trends and elasticity of demands. When an organisation is trying to figure out how to market its product, it needs to come up with a customer profile. A consumer profile is a way of describing a consumer categorically so they can be grouped for marketing and advertising purposes. Customer profile can be defined as customer description that includes demographic, geographic and psychographic characteristics, buying pattern, creditworthiness and purchase history. Take a look at the factors to consider when developing customer profile. Who are the customers? How do they buy? Why do they buy? What do they expect from buying? And what do they value when buying? Customer profiling can be done in the following categories. Spending power, types of hospitality business, menu or accommodation range, pricing considerations, expectations and requirements, and the meal experience. Let's take a look at spending power. Spending power is the degree to which people have money to buy products and services. The spending power of an individual can be affected by the following. The size of income, status, sociocultural influences or economic situation. Hospitality organisations will target their advertising and marketing towards customers taking these profiles into consideration. Accommodation range. Customers are profiled according to their desire for accommodation ranges which include hotel, guest accommodation, self-catering, service department, hostel, individual caravans, hire craft and hotel boat, and chalets. To generalise, eating establishments can be defined as low cost or high cost, small choice on menu or wide choice on menu, quick service of food or slow service of food cooked to order, self-service or high level of service, and basic ambience or high level of ambience. Pricing considerations 
Pricing is a very powerful weapon and is customer driven in the hospitality industry. Customers consider prices before making purchase decisions regarding hospitality products and services. Pricing considerations usually depend on the firm's average cost and on the customer's perceived value of the product in comparison to his or her perceived value of competing products. This graph shows factors in setting price. The meal experience. The meal experience may be defined as a series of events, both tangible and intangible, that a customer experiences when eating out. Tangible, which can be experienced by touching or seeing, like restaurant tables and chairs. Intangible, which can only be sensed or felt, like restaurant atmosphere. The five meal experience factors. One, food and beverages on offer. Two, level of service. Three, level of cleanliness and hygiene. Four, perceived value for money and price. And five, atmosphere of the establishment. Are you wearing the same thing you wore in the last one? No. No, I'm not, because the other one was the plate shirt. Plaid. Plaid shirt. Is plaid short for something? Like platypus? No, definitely not. <laughs> Jill and Josh Stanton and you're watching Lifestyle Branding Series. This week we're going to start drilling down to the nitty gritty of who you ideally serve and create your ideal customer avatar. So an ideal customer avatar is basically a made up person, a make believe person that you create who best represents your ideal customer within your audience. So you need to think about things like demographics, as well as personality traits. You need to get very specific, and we're gonna talk about that in this week's episode. Absolutely, but it can be a little intimidating, if not a little confusing, when you're first starting to create this avatar. So we put together three tips to help you create your ideal customer avatar. Tip number one, start by listing out the psychographic and demographic characteristics of this avatar. So what we mean by this is the different personality traits, the different characteristics, the different values, um, even like drill it down to things such as like age, gender, ethnicity, or even their location. You really have to get as specific as you can. I'm talking about what are their fears, what are their needs, what are their, their basic desires, uh, and what, what is their job, uh, what is their commute like to get to their job, are they married, what food do they like, um, what TV shows do they watch. I don't know, can I, how specific can you get? You wanna get as specific as possible. Absolutely, now I know this sounds overwhelming, but trust us, you just have to start by doing a, an entire brain dump. Just think of who it is your business serves ideally, and then you can break down those characteristics from there. You could even go as far as giving this person a name and even pulling an image off the web to really humanize this person. Now, once you've done that, move on to tip number two, which is to drill down as deep as you can. See, at this stage, you really need to start thinking like them and not like you. So you need to put yourself in their shoes. Start seeing the world how they see it. It's very important that you get rid of all you in, in this and start thinking purely about them. Absolutely. So like I said, it can be really overwhelming, if not intimidating, to get into the head and heart of your ideal customer. But if you can really tap into that compassion and start th seeing things the way they see things, then you can start to form your message, your branding, your copy, and your overall business around what this person needs and how you can best serve them. So now that you've got all that sorted, tip number three is to write a story as your ideal customer avatar. So what this means is you want to, again, put yourself in their shoes and we're gonna write a story and it's gonna be kind of like a journal, you know, that they would sit down and write themselves which would explain all their irrational fears and deepest desires, basically. Absolutely, the key here is to write this journal entry in the first person as your avatar. So 
you know, write things like after a typical day that they would have, or maybe something that they would never admit to anyone else. Like Josh said, their deep desires and irrational fears, all the things that, you know, your business serves to help them overcome or deal with or just help them with in general, those are things that should go out into this journal entry. Remember, compassion is key here. So you really want to get into their head and their heart. Once you do that, like I said, then you can start, you know, forming all your messaging and your copy and your branding around that specific person. And what this does is it helps them to have a me too moment. So what, what a me too moment is where they're reading your copy or they're reading your message and they're, th they're thinking to themselves, oh my gosh, that's me. This person is talking directly to me. It's like that happened to me as well. Yeah. I, know, I know exactly what they're talking about. Absolutely. And that's where you start to lock in that loyalty and build that relationship. Now we know this may seem a little bit overwhelming at first, but you just want to take it one step at a time. Absolutely. Remember, this is not a one hour exercise and you get it right every single time. It will develop over time, just like your USP from last week did. This isn't something you get right, right off the bat. You can always finesse it as your business grows and develops and you evolve and develop. Your ideal customer avatar will probably develop along with your business. All right. So that's our three tips on creating your ideal customer avatar. Now we want to hear from you. Tell us, have you created your ideal customer avatar? And if so, who are they? Share them with us in the comment section below so we can all learn from each other. And of course, if you're looking for even more great resources, head on over to screwthe9to5.com forward slash escape and sign up for your free seven day escape plan. And remember, don't. Part two, factors affecting average spending power in hospitality businesses. Let's define average spending power. Average spending power, or ASP, is the sum of revenue from sales divided by the number of customers. Average spending power in hospitality businesses can be affected by the following factors. Size of income, status, economic situation, pricing, and menu design. Size of income. Individual income is an economic indicator that helps gauge the strength of consumer sector in the UK. It also indicates the overall strength of the economy. Personal income determines consumer consumption and consumer spending affects the revenue of hospitality organisations. A rise in personal income will lead to an increase in disposable income. Status Status is the relative position of an individual within a group or of a group within a society. The term can refer to either high or low standing in the society. The status quo effect indicates the difference between mandatory and discretionary spending. People of high status find that spending in the hospitality industry is mandatory. Sociocultural influences Social or cultural influences are influences relating to or signifying the combination of interaction of social and cultural elements. Attitudes and feelings about spending in the hospitality industry tend to be closely tied to our cultural, moral and religious beliefs. On the basis of culture, some people view going to places such as hotels culturally unacceptable. On moral grounds, some people believe money spent in the hospitality is money wasted. Economic situation. The most important economic factors that affect average spending power in hospitality are wages and employment. Employment levels and average salaries can have a tremendous effect on economy-wide purchasing power. Taken in aggregate, the more people who are employed and the more money they earn, the more discussionary funds they will have to spend in the hospitality industry. Pricing. The single most important decision in evaluating a hospitality industry business is pricing power. Understanding the power of pricing is critical. Hospitality businesses don't have the power to raise prices without losing business to a competitor. There are different approaches to pricing in the hospitality industry and each approach is dynamic. Pricing in hospitality is consumer oriented. 
There are many pricing strategies used in the hospitality industry. Listed below are some of them. Premium pricing, penetration pricing, economy pricing and price skimming. Menu design. A well-designed menu can educate and entertain the customer as well as be a communication, cost control and marketing tool for your restaurant. The menu design must be congruent with the concept and an image of the restaurant and effectively communicate the overall dining experience to the guest. The menu is the most important internal marketing and sales tool a restaurant has to market its food and beverage to customers. It is the only piece of printed advertising that you are virtually 100% sure will be read by the guest. Once placed in the guest hand, it can directly influence not only what they will order, but ultimately how much they will spend. Let's summarise. Customer profile can be defined as customer description that includes demographic, geographic and psychographic characteristics, buying pattern, credit worthiness and purchase history. A customer profile is also an outline of the type of customers who are likely to purchase an organization's products. Spending power is the degree to which people have money to buy products and services. Average spending power in hospitality businesses can be affected by the following factors. Size of income, status, social or cultural influences, economic situation, pricing, and menu design. and service development is the creation of products and services with new or different characteristics that offer new or additional benefits to the customer. In this part, we will look at opportunities affecting product and service development and constraints affecting product and service development. Opportunities affecting product and service development are brand image, accommodation facilities, restaurant access, standardisation and hospitality advertising. Brand image. When a customer makes a decision to buy one product over another, the branding image of that product sometimes plays a significant role. Brands that are well established have a good reputation, are immediately recognisable to the consumer and are more likely to be purchased than those that are unknown. Accommodation facilities. Quality hotel accommodation is a critical element of the visitor experience for both our leisure and business visitors. The provision of quality accommodation facilities is an opportunity to develop products and services across the whole hotel setup. Restaurant access. Restaurant access is simply a way or means of approach to a restaurant. The building regulations require reasonable provision to be made for access to a building and use of facilities within a building. Standardisation For several years, hotel classification systems in several worldwide countries were formed to ensure safe and reliable lodging and food for guests at a time where very few trustworthy hotels existed. Hospitality advertising Hospitality advertising is the most potent weapon used not only to develop products and services in hospitality but also to make the improvements to existing products and services known to customers. Let's now move to constraints affecting product and service development and they can be financial constraints, cost, customer requirements, environmental constraints, hospitality advertising and availability of labour force. Part 2. Different merchandising opportunities for hospitality products and services. Air content has always been very important to travel agency business, but the offer has been changing. Airlines have been hit by high fuel prices, increased competition since the rise of low-cost carriers, and a decrease in premium traffic. 
They started merchandising to make up for lost profit. They rely on ancillary revenue pricing methods such as ancillary services and fair families. Ancillary revenue is all revenue not directly related to the cost of transportation. It includes a la carte features, frequent flyer programs, commission-based products and advertising sold by the airline. Ancillary services as a part of this let the traveller personalise their trip by adding services that used to be included in the fare, such as extra luggage or new additional services such as more comfortable seats, gourmet meals or in-flight Wi-Fi. With fair families, the traveller can easily compare prices and see the services included. They are bundles of fares that share the same conditions, for example, refundable or exchangeable, and include the same services and options like luggage, meals or mileage accrual. Often airlines start selling this enriched content through their direct channel first, which means you have less visibility and searching for the best available offer has become more time-consuming. And as more and more airlines start merchandising, travelers need you to help them make the right choice. We're integrating this enriched content into your point of sale so that you can see the latest and most accurate content in one place and provide better customer service. Strengthen customer relationships by offering customized trips and letting your customers know what value they're actually getting for their money. Not only that, but the possibility to become a more effective retailer and to start merchandising yourself is now in your hands. With Amadeus, you'll gain loyal customers by being more transparent, improve your business efficiency and above all, stay competitive in a changing world. What is merchandising? Merchandising is the planning and promotion of sales by presenting a product to the right market at the proper time by carrying out organised, skillful advertising using attractive displays etc. To merchandise is to encourage the sale of goods by advertising them or by making certain that they are noticed. It is basically about how you present the availability of your products and services and how effective your presentation of products and services is at enticing customers to buy. Simply put, you need to maximise your sales. There is a true saying, if customers don't know about it, they definitely won't buy it. LEK Consulting is the leading strategic advisor to the aviation industry. One of the world's largest airlines was facing declining revenues during difficult economic times. The company selected LEK Consulting to re-examine its core offerings and recommend new strategies. Leading the team was LEK's head of global aviation and travel practice, a 20-year veteran, John Thomas. The CEO of probably one of the best regarded airlines in the world threw down the challenge to us that said, you know, you guys at LEK are really smart. This industry is broken. Can you come with some innovative ideas to the industry? John, in turn, brought the challenge to his LEK team. How could we actually sort of find a new business model that can just totally change the economics of the airline industry? LEK has probably researched about 120,000 travellers in the US, so we know more about the US traveller than anyone else. Um, and there's a lot of energy there in terms of what different customer segments are looking for from their airline providers. Based on this deep understanding of the airline traveller and combining with LEK merchandising expertise, they developed a very innovative premise. Airlines sell seats but do a very poor job in merchandising and they have uh, millions and millions of passengers that they have let's say captive and they could merchandise a whole raft of products to those, uh, to those passengers. With this combination of aviation experience and retailing perspective, 
the LEK team formulated a sound strategy in bringing about a new business model for the client. We basically did the diagnostic which said uh, here, here are the suite of products that we think that you should offer, here's the implementation plan, this is how long it will take you to uh, implement it, here's the capital requirement. The board signed off on it and basically gave the airline um, a mandate to go out and develop this business. Some of those new concepts have been copied across the industry. The critical aspect was rather than, you know, airlines invest in, air, in aircraft because they've got to keep, keep people flying, but this was actually a step out where they had to invest in, in something that was really not core to them on the hope that it would have huge returns. And in order to get them out of the comfort zone, you need to give them clarity in terms of how they're going to make those changes. We bought the merchandising expertise to roll out these products, and then uh, that lasted for about two years. Um, and then we, we basically bought in, um, or we actually recruited people to take over from us. The results have generated significant new revenues and have been transformational for both LEK's client and the industry. Most of what we've been doing has been, has been front page type work. For an industry that, you know, in bad times could lose 10 to 15 billion dollars, uh, we actually think that merchandising is worth, in terms of revenue terms, about 40 to 50 billion dollars. So if you take that a 50 percent margin on that, you know, this is the difference between the airlines losing money and making substantial money. This new model, combining airline and merchandising, is growing throughout the entire industry. Unfortunately, what we've found, what LEK's found with all of our cli airline clients is that when we go in and they invest in this merchandising, the return that they get from that investment is through the roof. Let's look at merchandising journey. This is when you look at optimising your merchandising opportunities throughout a potential customer's typical experience or journey with you. This could be the journey of a passerby who converts to a customer, or a regular who enters your premises several times per week to transact, or a new visitor to your website, or a passenger travelling on one of your tours for the first time. Well-planned and executed merchandising will stop, attract, persuade or reassure and reinforce a customer in their experience of your product or service. Pavement signage, external messaging, window messaging or a homepage banner should be designed to stop the potential customer in their tracks. Attracting is the second stage merchandising aimed at customers already entering your business or who are already on your website. The aim is to present attractive opportunities to purchase through effective use of clear messaging, images, displays and product presentation. You want to entice this customer to stay and purchase. The third stage is merchandising aimed at customers at the point of decision making, providing them with visual information that will influence their decision positively and hopefully persuade them to buy or to buy more than they first intended. This could be a well-presented deli bar, a countertop menu, a specials board, or beautifully presented treats beside the payment point with a clear price. And the last stage, reassure and reinforce. This is merchandising at or around a point of delivery that reassures the customer that they have made the right buying decision. This could be through product and service quality and presentation, loyalty rewards, and upselling techniques. Upselling is a sales technique whereby a seller induces the customer to buy more expensive items, upgrades, or other add-ons in an attempt to make more profitable sale. The Selling Essentials Minute. One good idea in about 60 seconds. When you're trying to upsell a customer, there are three important basics. Number one, the time to upsell is immediately after you've closed the original sale. Trying to sell thing two when you haven't sold thing one is usually a bad idea. It can make you look greedy in the buyer's eyes and you could blow the whole deal. But wait too long and you'll lose momentum.
The moment you make that sale is the moment you've earned the buyer's trust. By buying from you, they've given you a huge vote of confidence. It's prime time to try your upsell because it's when they want to believe you and hear your ideas. How you mention those ideas brings us to basic two. The four most important words in upselling, oh, by the way, as in, oh, by the way, now that you've got your thousand units, I wonder if having us pre-assemble the components would be helpful to you. Does that sound desperate or greedy? No, you just sound like a colleague casually mentioning an alternative and seeking a win-win. Basic number three, that oh, by the way, should never be an accident. Though it's delivered casually, it should be the product of homework you've done about the buyer from the beginning of the sales process. If you are suggesting pre-assembly, for example, it's because you know they've had assembly problems in the past. Use the basic three and you'll get two great results. A better outcome for the buyer and a bigger sale for you. Let's summarize. The opportunities affecting product and service development are brand image, accommodation facilities, restaurant access, standardization, and hospitality advertising. The constraints affecting product and service development are financial constraints, availability of labor force, cost, and environmental constraints. To merchandise is to encourage the sale of goods by advertising them or making certain that they are noticed. Well-planned and executed merchandising will stop, attract, persuade or reassure and reinforce a customer in their experience of your product or service. <laughs>